coffee. Oh, let's go. Yeah, water. Yeah. Ready. Hello, my lovely photogs. Welcome to another video, a Q&A video. It's been a little bit. It's been a little while since we talked last. Uh, full disclosure, the reason why I'm making this right now is because I knew for the last two weeks, I'm gonna be pretty busy with, uh, with client work. And so I wanted to make something a little bit more easier to make, something that freed me up a little bit and uh, allowed me the mental bandwidth to to do my best on the client work that I just did in there these last two weeks. So that's why we're uh, doing this Q&A. Um, but you know, I love talking to you guys and it's been a little while anyway. So happy to do it. So over on my Discord, I asked you guys if you had any questions as usual, way too many for me to reply back to in a single video, unfortunately. But um, I'll get through to the ones that have the most reacts and uh, hopefully we'll uh, We'll answer the rest of the questions in a future video, maybe. So, let's get to it. Mm. All right, so the first question, a mildly philosophical question here. How do you think photography positively contributes to societies and communities, and what do you consider your impact to be as a travel photographer? Starting deep, we're going deep, first one. All right, that's cool. Um, the first part of this question, how do you think photography positively contributes to society? So this one's an interesting one, uh, very philosophical. Um, I think the biggest thing about photography is that for me personally, I see it as a vehicle for self-expression and connection. I think this connection between two people is a super important uh, activity for, you know, at a societal scalable level. Uh, I think photography as a vehicle to enable that, to e enable this self-expression of people, and then for someone to connect to that art is I think one of the most beautiful things about visual language and visual art in general. Uh, and that for me is, yeah, I think that would be the most important thing that uh, I see photography allowing societies and communities to, uh, to have. As for the second part, uh, what do you consider your impact to be as a travel photographer? I think for me personally, um, I spent a lot of time trying to understand what travel photography means to me and what my, I guess, role in society is, uh, doing my job that is. Um, and with me, I see travel photography as, well, my travel photography specifically, as a means of inspiration and a means of uh, inspiring people to get out there in the world. Because when I first started photography, or even before I first started photography, you know, getting out of school and all that kind of stuff, I wasn't the kind of guy who uh, went all over the world and got a chance to discover that. I went straight into the workforce. I didn't have a lot of downtime after I finished school and so, um, that was something that I always missed. And now that I get the opportunity to, to travel, well, sans pandemic, uh, it's, it's something that I'm really passionate about, you know, discovering the world and sharing my discoveries and inspiring people to go and discover it themselves is a, a huge uh, a reason for me doing my work. And so, yeah, I love to inspire people to go and explore on their own. All right. The next one, how do you like naturally come up with ideas to post people in portrait photography? And if you can, I need tips on how to get better at things like portraits. So, okay, the way I see this is that there's two kinds of models, right? Two kinds of models. And on the one side, you have professional models, people that are doing modeling for a full-time gig or you know at least a part-time gig or someone who just has a lot of experience with modeling. These professional models have honed their looks, honed their styles, honed their colors, honed their angles, right? They've practiced a lot of that over time. And so with these professional models, people who are really experienced at it, let them do their thing. They've worked on their looks for quite a long time. So trust them, try and get the most out of them doing that because they know their bodies and their angles a lot more than you probably do. And so, you know, 
you as a photographer, the role as a photographer in that setting with a professional model, trust them and loosely guide them if need be. Uh, but I think for me personally, the way I think about it is that if you're shooting a professional model, your job is more aligned to making sure the context is okay, making sure the setting and the focal lengths and the colors and everything else um, that the model is in, that for me anyway, is, is more of your responsibility rather than um, directing and posing and, and all those kind of things. Of course, you know, if you need a pose or the light's not hitting in the right direction or something like that, then you obviously do need to make those adjustments. But for the most part, trust your models. In the event that you're shooting a non-professional model, that's where things get a little bit different, especially when you're first starting, you know, portraiture, if you're shooting friends uh, or, you know, people who don't have that much experience or you're just trying to build up your portfolio, then yeah, these people may not know their angles, right? They may not know the best looks for them. And so they do need a little bit of a direction from you. And in order for you to, to help them in that way, this is gonna sound really weird, but I've given this advice you know, constantly, and this is the same advice that, uh, that I did when I was first starting uh, taking portraits, uh, which is to watch shows like America's Top Model, right? and literally mimic for yourself the poses, the looks, the angles that they're doing so that you know personally those angles and those poses and how to direct your models in that way. Because you can't really know what's good until you see someone who is good and what they do, right? Study the poses that they make and emulate them as much as you can so that you can recognize these poses in the field and you know what uh, what good looks like. Next one, from the gears that you own, is there something you wish you hadn't bought? So I've been through a lot of gear in my lifetime. You know, I've been through probably two or three dozen different lenses. Uh, the there's not a lot of stuff that I regret because I cycle through a lot of things, well, I used to cycle through a lot of things so that I understand what I needed and what I didn't need. Uh, and that whole period is behind me now. So uh, nowadays I'm a lot more deliberate with not only what I decide to bring with me in my camera bag, but also what I decide to keep at home as well. But there was one lens in particular that I really didn't enjoy that much, which was the Samyang 14 millimeter. It was a f2.8 manual lens that was just like soft as a potato and it was just not a great lens at all. Definitely regret getting that, but um, you live and you learn, right? Flex on us real quick, lol. What's your max bench squat dead and overhead press? <laughs> okay, so I haven't been training max reps uh, in the last couple of years because I, I've been injuring myself a lot. So I've just been doing body weight stuff, but last time I measured would have been 120, 180, 220, and 80 in that order. Uh, what are the top animes that inspire you? Well, uh, I, I hate answering these questions because it requires me to, you know, melt down all the animes that I've watched in my lifetime and, and rank them, and I don't really like doing that. Um, that and because I've watched a lot of animes and uh, I don't remember a bunch of different ones, but uh, ones that come to mind is more of like a categorical type of thing. And especially when it comes to inspiration and animes that inspire my work, right? Uh, typically the shonens don't do that for me because they're just all like action, pow, 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 bang, 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 you know what I mean? Um, so it's mostly the like slice of life, the more slow paced types of animes. There was this anime that I did a video on recently, like a visual analysis called March Comes In Like a Lion, which uh, you can watch in the link in the description below, where I just break down the anime and some of the compositions that I do like. Uh, but some others that come to mind are stuff like uh, Clannad, Violet Evergarden, uh, Chunibyo and Love and Other Delusions, I think that's what it's called. Uh, anything Makoto Shinkai, <laughs> um, yeah, anything by Kyoto Animation, uh, and yeah, there's just so much more. 
Can you share with us a nugget of wisdom you learned from the nomadic adventures you did in the previous years? Ah, this is a great question. Um, so these tips, I guess, might not apply to everyone because I'm a very introverted person. I need time alone. Uh, but it is in that introvertism that, you know, when I was alone traveling, I realized a lot of things about me and a lot of things about what I like and what I don't like. The biggest thing for me was that connection with other people keeps me sane. And I didn't think that would be such a big deal because I am such an introvert and because I do need so much time alone uh, to recharge. But the connections you have with people, especially on the road, are so far and few in between that the, the connections you have when you do get deep with someone, it makes it feel all the more special. And uh, I realized that I need those kinds of deep relationships uh, when I'm traveling. That being said, you know, not all relationships are made equal. There are some people that you meet that, you know, uh, you don't need to over index on. Uh, you don't need to go so hard into. I think one of the things that I got caught out with was there are people where you just, you click with someone maybe initially and you know, you, you kind of go too hard on that relationship for too long because you've been starved on all these other relationships, right? Uh, Cause you've been on the road and yeah, just, just being careful of that because that doesn't always work out. I think relationships are when you're on the road and when I say relationships, I mean friendships and you know, any, anywhere in between. I think you just need to be careful with who you decide to spend your time with and know that the deeper relationships on the road are really important and really special to, well, for me anyway, for, for my own well-being. Uh, on the tactical side, I realized that you can live on a lot less than you realize. So for when I was traveling alone, I was literally traveling just with like a mid-sized suitcase and my camera backpack, and that's kind of it. There's not a lot of things on the road that you actually need to live a fulfilling life. You know, the majority of life's experiences don't live in your suitcase. And so, yeah, try and, and, and strip everything down. You know, even if you're at home and you're, you're bored for a little while and you wanna see, you know, when this pandemic thing is all over and you wanna see whether or not you have what it takes to be able to live like that, try it out. And I think, you know, you will be surprised with how little you can actually live with. Mm. My cup is getting cold. This is the sound of sadness. Do you guys do that? Is that weird? I'm licking the jar. Okay. Anyway, in terms of storytelling through your images, what and who have been your key inspirations and does putting forward a good story ever stop you from posting images you really like? So I guess I look at storytelling a little bit differently because I have a, a long design background. And so for me specifically, I don't have any super specific inspirations that I can recall, but my biggest kind of I guess focus when it comes to storytelling in photography is this idea of visual hierarchy, which is something from my <laughs> design career uh, in which there's always a, a level of, you know, a hierarchy of importance of elements in your compositions. And it is the interplay between those, those levels between that hierarchy that enables these stories to be told. So that's really important for, for my work but at the same time, storytelling in photography, the way I see it, doesn't necessarily need to be like me, the photographer, telling you something through the image. It can also be, and commonly is, a, a kind of like recollection or a, a spark that occurs in the viewer's mind, in the viewer's experience, that reminds them of a time, or that reminds them of a story, their own stories, uh, which is what the, the image allows them to do. So I think storytelling can happen both, both ways. 
and it could also just happen separately through you know the viewer's experience and all those kind of things uh but yeah there's a whole bunch of different devices in which uh it works and a lot of different methods to which it works how do you find people to work with and models to shoot in japan was there a language barrier how did you overcome it so uh work-wise agencies in tokyo there's a lot of them and i've worked with a bunch probably in my time probably about like i don't know maybe half a dozen to a dozen different agencies but those kind of work opportunities are pretty easy to execute on because these agencies there are a whole bunch of agencies right that are like purely japanese and there's a whole bunch of other ones that are like you know getting into more of the influencer market and um and that kind of deal that are english speaking as well and so those types of jobs are easy. They're just like any other agency jobs you might find all over the world. They speak English, they have a brief, you do it, they pay you, very straightforward. Uh, for the more like Japanese only stuff, I personally haven't dealt with that because I don't speak Japanese very well. And so, you know, I've always kind of just turned down those offers when they come through. But yeah, any English speaking agencies in Japan, I have had no problems working with communication wise. Uh, mostly they're the ones contacting me, but same thing as, you know, living in any other major city around the world, you can go and proactively approach those agencies by just looking them up if you want to, if you want to go down that route, which actually if you're like building your portfolio, then I do highly recommend you do. Models on the other hand, Japanese models are a completely different kettle of fish because the majority of them don't speak English, at least the majority of them I've met anyway. And so those shoots can often be a little bit awkward because if you don't have a basic level of Japanese, like for me, I have like a like an N4-ish, uh, so it goes 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, uh, N4-ish level of Japanese, uh, which is basic as and not even as good as a preschooler really. So, you know, I can get by. Um, but not well at all. And it, there is a language barrier. But again, if they are experienced models, then, you know, they know what they're doing. They've got poses, they've got angles, they've got looks, they've got colors. And so a little bit of like hand signaling and direction is always, um, is always welcome and always understood. But in terms of finding them, uh, it's literally just, I jump on Instagram. Uh, I try and like search for other people, other Japanese photographers who have taken photos with models that I like the look of personally, and then I'll reach out to them and see if they wanna shoot. It helps a lot because on my profile, I already have a bunch of portraits and stuff that I've already shot. And so I don't look like a creep who doesn't ever shoot portraits, right? Like, I think that's really important when you're trying to first reach out to models is that, that you have a uh, a body of work that shows that you do that kind of work and that you want to do more of it rather than you know just taking photos of landscapes and then hitting up a model and then them looking at your profile and being like uh, uh i don't really know whether or not this guy's just trying to creep on me or not so keep that in mind anime has been an inspiration for your style i also remember you said in another video that you like reading yes i do yes i do like reading do you think what you read also has any effect on your works slash style are there any other things you get your philosophical mental intellectual lifestyle etc inspirations from and which one of them also reflects your creative work directly or indirectly wow okay so this is a huge question for me personally i almost exclusively read nonfiction. I love philosophy and self-development stuff and you know stuff about stoicism. But the biggest thing that has carried through with me, the biggest theme of things over all the hundreds of books that I've read over you know my entire previous career and into this career right now is the idea and the theme of simplicity. And so I read a lot of books about, you know, stoic mentality, about minimalism, about this idea of simplification of things, of thoughts, of process. And that has been the biggest kind of theme in both my 
my research and my, my reading and in my actual creative work as well. Like this idea of simplifying everything. And that's why I always talk about, you know, the idea of visual hierarchy or the idea of subject and, you know, making those things clear because clarity and simplification are two things that are deeply rooted in both my, my own personal beliefs and uh, the work that I do. GIF or GIF? Is that like GIF or GIF? It, it's GIF, I'm not a crazy person. <laughs> what was your best and worst shooting experience as a professional? So it's kind of a weird thing to hear me being called like a professional because I don't really consider myself a professional. Like I'm just doing what I'm doing, enjoying myself, enjoying my experiences and then sharing that. Anyway, sidebar, um, my best experience as like best professional experience anyway was recently with Sony. Uh, I made a video on that, which you can check out in the link in the description below. But in that project, we went to Uluru and uh, filmed an ad for Sony. And that project was just so, so fun. So good, so well organized, so well run. Uh, the end product was fantastic. A whole bunch of things went really, really well. That was probably my, my best experience so far uh, in terms of like professional experience. Uh, in terms of the worst, well, I, I don't really want to name names. Uh, I don't wanna like out anyone, but let's just say that there are some clients, some agencies, some people, that get it and can organize something really, really well. And then there are other people that just have no idea what they're doing. All right, next. Sup Pat, did you struggle at the beginning trying to find a style? How did you start to share content on Instagram and other media? Okay, so this is a two part question. To answer your first part, check the link in the description below for a video that I made on how to find your style because it's so confusing. <laughs> In general, it is a confusing, difficult path to navigate. But the bottom line is this, when you first start photography, when you're in your first three, five years, whatever it might be, your style is everything. Your style has to be everything. No one starts photography fresh and is like, my style is this, right? I know exactly what I'm going to shoot exactly how I'm going to shoot it, exactly when I'm going to shoot it. No one is like that when they first start out, right? You need experience. You need to try a whole bunch of stuff and understand what you like and what you don't like. It's because when you first start out, you don't have this understanding that your style, and I mentioned this in the video, your style is everything. And it's meant to be that way as well. It's meant to be this process of distillation of understanding what you gravitate towards. So for me now, you know, I have refined my own personal style to the point where I can go to a location, a brand new location, whether it be a landscape, a, a portrait shoot, a uh, piece of architecture, street photography, whatever. And in my mind, even though it's a fresh, like, vista right it's a it's a fresh uh, place that i've never seen before i'll know the the dozen or so odd compositions that i personally want to get immediately when i arrive because i've done them so many different times even though that you know the place may be new or different i know exactly what i want and what i'm looking for and you only get to that point when you have tried a whole bunch of stuff when you realize that you like X visual pattern, when you realize you like X color, when you realize you like X category of photography, when you try all these different things and you understand what you like, it's only then that you know that, you know, this is your style. And for the second part of the question, how did you start to share content on Instagram and other media? Well, at the beginning, you just do it. <laughs> but you do it with this intention to build creative confidence. I think that's really important. So the things that you put out into the world when you're in your first few years of Instagram are gonna be shit. I'm gonna just lay that out there for you right now. Like chances are for the majority of you, that work is crap. And I don't mean that in a, in a really mean way. 
I will look back on my own work in that time period and say it too was also crap. But the thing is, when you know that, it takes the pressure off you tremendously to just keep trying and keep pushing things out there day after day after day. And it's only when you put the reps in in that way, when you start to build that creative confidence that you know that sometimes you will put something out there that sticks, that really works, that is really good, right? Keep doing that over and over and over again. Don't care what people say, just listen to the feedback and listen to the response on your work. And you'll know eventually over time with enough reps, what is good and what is not. So at the beginning, just try, try and try again. And then over time, try and find this, this, this commonality, you know, this thread, this common thread in your work of pieces that are actually good. I personally think moving fast in this instance and breaking a whole bunch of stuff, making a whole bunch of mistakes is way better than taking it slow and maybe posting one image every week or something like that, or every couple of days. I think you'll eventually reach the same destination, but I personally think if you push yourself to keep creating and keep posting and keep sharing every single day or more, then you will reach that destination faster even if you make more mistakes along the way. Okay, next. How was your experience transitioning from behind to in front of the camera to do videos on YouTube? Were you shy and nervous and how do you feel today? So yeah, if you go back to my, my cringy first video uh, where I just said hello, really, um, <laughs> it was a lot more awkward than it is now. And I think, you know, I, I, I am happy with the progress that has been happening over the past, eight, nine, however long months it is. Uh, but it's a it's an ongoing process. And you know, I'm going to look back in a year or two or whatever at this very video and cringe at it as well. Because, you know, the progression happens naturally over time. And yeah, I would I definitely didn't start this whole YouTube thing being super confident. If anything, it was exactly the opposite. You know, I, I had a conversation with my my mate the other day. Uh, in which I said like, I, I would have started YouTube a long, long time ago, but it is the, the shyness and the introversion and the nervousness that I have innate with me that took me so long to build up my confidence in order to even get in front of the camera in the first place. And so, yeah, I would have started YouTube like four years ago if it wasn't for that, but it is what it is and we're here now. I think uh, live streaming has been helping me immensely recently. So I've been doing that over at twitch.tv forward slash heypackk. But live streaming allows me to just riff in front of the camera for long periods of time and take away the, the shyness and the nervousness of being in front of the lens. Uh, so yeah, that's been really, really helpful. All right, last question because I think uh, this video has gone long enough. Are expensive gear a hindrance sometimes? For example, the fear of breaking something expensive like lenses or bodies or being too scared for a shoot under bad conditions, etc. So for me, it's actually kind of the opposite, funnily enough. Um, so as I've transitioned a lot of my gear to the more, I guess, like the more expensive stuff, right? The more expensive stuff tends to have better weather sealing more you know weather resistance is able to you know be out in all conditions for longer and so if anything i've gotten more reckless with my gear all the time like i remember there was this one uh so this one time when i was in the faroe islands flying my mavic you know i'm flying it in freaking gale force winds with snow and like it's just really hectic conditions and i'm like yeah i'm just flying and it's normal and you know happy days whatever because I know the limits of how far it can go and how far I can push it. And then even the other day when I was doing um, a POV video, you know, I'm walking around the city shooting images with no cover on my camera at all. And it's just pissing down rain. I've got a raincoat on, but no protection on the camera at all. And I'm like, yeah, easy, whatever. So yeah, if anything, the more expensive stuff has me feeling a little bit more safe than, uh, than the cheaper gear that I used to have. All right, I am out of coffee and I am out of battery. My camera is blinking at me right now. 
So I'm going to end this video here. Thank you so much for watching. If you have any other questions or you know, want to hang out with the community, check us out on Discord. Here is the link for that. Thank you for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed it. Hit that like button, subscribe, and all that good stuff. I'll see you in the next one. But until then, get out there and make something that matters. Peace.